So the meeting today is about uh, Syria and the Syrian civil war. And I think uh, when we talk about Syria, before we can do anything, before we can touch the actual subject, we have to uh, dig through a very thick layer of lies and hypocrisy and deception and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and these kind of things in order to find what's actually going on. Because especially in Western media, it is anything but the truth which is basically uh, reported. And it's not only reported, it's bom we're bombarded with this uh, uh, with these uh, scenes of Aleppo and the children dying and with the terrible, terrible things which are happening. And of course, we're not saying that the civil war is not a terrible thing, but to understand it, you have to look at, look at it from the right angle. Now, they talk about uh, Aleppo being bombed, but at the same time, while Aleppo was being bombed and was being attacked by Russian and Iranian and Syrian troops, uh, the war in Yemen, which is basically besieged 11 million people in the poorest Arab country uh, and the, 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 one of the countries in the world, in fact, with the lowest amount of water, access to water, has been besieged for more than a year and a half. And millions of men, women and children are uh, on the edge of basically dying, on the edge of starvation and living in an extremely difficult uh, uh, conditions. They talk about barrel bombs, uh, you know, because the Assad regime has used barrel bombs. It just shows how weak its air, air force is, really. Uh, but in Saudi Arabia, the United States and Britain is selling, is selling to the Saudis for their war in Yemen cluster bombs, the most modern cluster bombs, which is basically bombs which are designed to kill as many people as possible. And in fact... Uh, the way they're used over cities is that they're, they're designed to kill as many civilians as possible. And this is just being sold, you know, in, in the tons and the hundreds of tons to the Saudis for their war in Yemen. And this war is not just carried by the, by the Saudis, it's directly supported by the U.S. and Britain in every aspect, as, except with soldiers and actual bombing. So you have, like, uh, U.S. jet, U.S. planes refueling Saudi jets so they can just continue bombing without actually landing. But then, obviously, it's, it's Saudi jets doing it. And you have U.S. officers in the control rooms showing the targets in, in, in uh, different areas of Yemen. But obviously, it's not the, the Americans pulling the trigger. And the American Navy has completely um, surrounded all of the sea borders of Yemen. And, and, they're, and they're a part of this, uh, this whole war. And nothing is being said about this. If we move a bit closer to uh, Syria, in Mosul, you have an operation of taking Mosul, which is a disastrous operation. And funnily enough, some of the groups which are fighting in Mosul are the same Iranian-supported groups that the Americans criticize in Aleppo. But in Mosul, they're fine. In fact, in Mosul, because the Americans and the Iraqi government is in such a rush to take Mosul, uh, it's, it's beginning to cost a lot of lives, many more than... Uh, than anything in Aleppo. And Mosul is a town of, of more than one million people at the moment. It's a much bigger town. It's much bigger than eastern Aleppo. And yet, nothing is being said about this. Again, if we go a bit further up, in the Kurdish areas of Turkey, you have whole towns, uh, Jezire, Shilopi, and um, a district of Sur in Diyarbakir, which is, which is the capital of the Kurdish areas in, in Turkey. Um, the whole towns and the whole neighborhoods are being completely leveled. For more than a year, they've been besieged and then bombarded by, uh, by air and by, you know, with tanks and so on. And you look at pictures from these towns, it's just a pile of rubble. There's nothing left in these towns where hundreds of thousands of people used to live. Now, why don't we hear anything about this? And instead, we heard about what's going on in Aleppo. And I would just say, in fact, the fact is, that uh, doesn't say anything about the humanitarian nature of, of Putin. We don't have any illusions in him being humanitarian. But the Russians were very well aware of the PR aspect of taking Aleppo. And they, made a, they, they actually made uh, a lot of preparations in order to have as few people killed as possible. In fact, if you look at it from, you know, from a purely military point of view, urban warfare is very bloody normally. And even the rebels, the so-called opposition in Syria only reported about 800, 1,000 died after, like, when, when the whole thing was almost finished, which is nothing compared to what's being killed everywhere else. But 
That's what's being highlighted. It doesn't mean that we don't care about people dying and that we, we, you know, we like the war or we're some kind of pro-Russia or pro-Assad. But it's just to show the hypocrisy of the West in this whole situation. In, in the Iraq war, you know, they talk about the barbarism of ISIS and, uh, and Assad and everyone else. But the, in the Iraq war, the occupation of Iraq killed directly more than one million people just by directly, you know, by military means. More than one million people have been killed. It's far more than ISIS uh, will ever kill uh, or Assad or anyone else basically in, in the area. And yet no one is talking about it. And what they did in Iraq is a, is a, is a crime of, you know, which, which will continue to haunt the region for many more years. Because if you looked at Iraq before the occupation, there was no Al-Qaeda. There was no terrorism. There was no sectarianism as such. Saddam Hussein was a very unpleasant dictator. And I think most Iraqis probably disliked him. But in fact, if you ask people today, they would rather live under Saddam Hussein than to live with what they have today. And look at, look at Iraq. It's, it's full of sectarian militias, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and even worse things, tribal militias, you know, uh, uh, religious militias, national militias, and the whole of Iraq is basically disintegrated. And it's destabilizing the whole region. And the, the Syrian civil war is itself an effect coming out of that war. Now, no one, no one is mentioning that crime. In fact, over the summer in Britain, there was a Chilcot report which put the blame on that war on the Americans and the Brits who, who lied, who had no basis other, other than pure arrogance, really, imperialist arrogance, to, to invade that, that country. And they committed war crimes. But now no one, no one is talking about this. Uh, and instead, they're uh, kicking up an extremely big fuss about Aleppo and the so-called, you know, the moderates, the moderate rebels, right? First of all, rebel is like someone who's a revolutionary. Although they won't call them revolutionaries anymore, I think. But they call them rebels to imply that they could be revolutionaries. And they're moderate, but, but then moderate against what? You know, why, why would you use the word moderate if, 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 you know, instead of just saying they're good guys? Or it just means basically that they're not as bad as the worst things you can find. But I would say, in fact... That's even a lie, because if you look at the groups that they call the so-called modern rebels, they never mention them. If you read an article, they never say who, like, who these actual people are. But if you look at all the groups which dominate the Syrian civil war, the biggest one and the most powerful one, except for ISIS, is what used to be called Jabhat al-Nusra, which is basically al-Qaeda. The second biggest one is Ahrar al-Sham, which is a... Maybe a bit less violent, but it's not really less violent because it dominates, it rules over a whole governorate. It has like a small emirate that it runs with Jabhat uh, al-Nusra. And it has a, a, a few years ago, it was almost fusing with Jabhat al-Nusra. For most of its history, it's been a sympathizing section of Al-Qaeda. There's no difference between, ideologically, between these. It was only because of, you know, they kept, they, basically the powers who were, Funding these people were keeping them separate in order to use them for diplomatic purposes, to have like a clean face to, to do business with. But ideologically, and even in practice, they've committed the same types of uh, crimes that, the, um, that, that ISIS has. And in fact, you know, they all came from the same organization. ISIS, in fact, set up Jabhat al-Nusra. They set it up because they saw there was lots of money and guns and arms in Syria, and they set it up to get some of that some of that, but then they, they split for completely, basically for personal reasons, not for political reasons or ideological reasons. Um, then if you, if you look at the smaller groups, which are all dependent on these, these major groups, the, the, one of the most powerful ones was the Nuradin Zinki uh, uh, group, battalion, brigade I think it's called. Um, and they received support from the CIA until very recently, direct support, they received arms and money and even now, they still receive lots of support, but it's a bit more covert. But over the summer, there was a video with them which surfaced uh, about a Palestinian boy of 13 years of age that they caught. And they held him in the back of a truck and they taunted him. And then in the end, they decapitated him with cold, in cold blood. Um, these are the people that, you know, the, the moderate, the, you know, the groups that the West support and who are supposed to be fighting for democracy basically that's what's implied although they, ne they never say this and if you look at all the other groups basically first of all they're completely they're so tiny they can never make any any difference 
And also, they just function within the bigger armies set up by Jabhat al-Nusra and Ahrar, basically controlled by Jabhat al-Nusra and Ahrar al-Sham. And at any moment, they can be crushed by these armies. But they only exist because they give a cover for uh, Western imperialism, basically, to give arms, to funnel arms and money, which is then passed on to these other groups uh, later on. Um, there was a... Um, there was a report by the Pentagon's intelligence agency, the DIA, in 2014. Now, the Pentagon has always had a different line than the CIA. The Pentagon says we shouldn't support these Islamist guys because it, it's never worked before. And uh, so there's a bit of a split. And the Pentagon is the people supporting the Kurdish forces, for example. And the CIA are the ones supporting the Islamists uh, more directly. Um, but the, the Pentagon made a report in 2014 or 15, and it was leaked, basically predicting the rise of... Oh, so, sorry, it was made in 2012, but it was released in 2014. Basically predicting the rise of ISIS, uh, predicting a, 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 a group, which is probably going to be Al-Qaeda, it's going to set up a small state covering northern and western Iraq and eastern Syria. Um, but, uh, and also stated directly the fact that these, this group, these groups are being supported and this development is being pushed by our own allies, by Turkey, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and, and, and so on. And this is the real fact that, that what these people have been supporting, what the West has been supporting as the so-called moderate rebels or whatever they, they used to call them, before that it was freedom fighters. In fact, there's several videos calling people from ISIS, uh, you know, news clips and so on, calling ISIS people freedom fighters before they were called ISIS and before they exploded, basically. Um, even in Denmark, there was a documentary. I always found it the most surreal thing. It was a one-hour documentary about the most criminal uh, gang leader in, in Copenhagen back then. Stoy was his name. He was called the Scissor because he used to cut so many fingers. right? And they made a one-hour documentary. At, first of all, for years, they had been demonizing him as the bad guy opposed to the rockers who were the good gangsters, you remember? And then suddenly they made a documentary with this guy. Oh, he's found peace now. He wants to make amends. And he's going back. He's going to fight for the revolution. He's going to Syria. And they made a, basically a one-hour advertisement for going to Syria and fighting. And who did he join? Ahrar al-Sham, the sympathizing section of, of Al-Qaeda back then. So this is what the West has been, has been supporting. And this is what... Uh, what the truth is about the so-called opposition, opposition in Syria uh, uh, today. And this is what we need to understand before we begin to make any judgment or any analysis of the situation in, in, in Syria. Even if we go further back, Islamic fundamentalism, which is such a major threat for them, which is such a big thing and they accuse everyone, every foreign Muslim basically for being that, has never been able to exist a single day without money coming from uh, the West, basically, without billions and billions of dollars being funneled and then being supported in every way by Western countries. And now this started in the 50s uh, when they realized that Islamism was the, most, um, was the most effective tool against communist and socialist ideas in the Middle East. And they started you know, to, to support these groups out of Saudi Arabia, out of Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood especially, and they used them against the different revolutionary and left-wing nationalist movements which, which, which came about. The Nasser's movement was, it, during that time, they supported the Muslim Brotherhood against Nasser. Uh, <clears throat> and especially in Afghanistan, they used the Taliban, you know, the Mujahideen before that, uh, and, and Osama bin Laden against, um, against the, the revolutionary developments in, in the 70s and 80s there. In Indonesia, they used the Islamists against the communist movement, which led to more than one million communists being killed. And there's countless uh, um, examples of this. Uh, but the fact is that Islamic fundamentalism has never been able to function or exist, has never been able to exist independently without, without direct support from Western imperialism. Uh, and it really reflects also the... The, the theory of the permanent revolution, you could say, in a way. Because in order to find... You see, in the, in the Middle East in the 50s, there was dozens of movements uh, throughout, uh, throughout the whole region. 
And every single one of them, most of them, in fact, started as bourgeois, liberal, and democratic movements. But, for instance, like the Nasserite revolution or the, the Nasser's revolution in Egypt. But starting from a capitalist point of view, at every step, they were radicalized and they moved to the left because they saw imperialism and capitalism as a barrier to do anything to, if they wanted to develop their country and so on. And therefore, all the movements very quickly moved to the left. And the only people that the imperialists could find to shore up this development was basically going back to the most backward areas, the most backward elements, representing pre-pre-pre-capitalist societies, you know, wanting a society which is hundreds of years old, basically. These were the only forces, the absolutely most reactionary ones, that didn't move to the left and that they could depend on to be completely counter-revolutionary because it's, it's built within the whole movement and the ideology. Um, so that's the truth of the matter when we talk about barbarism and, and, uh, uh, and, and tragedy, is that imperialism, with everything they've done in the Middle East for the past 50 years, have been the single biggest root of counter-revolution, of reaction and barbarism. And no other force has done as much damage and will do as much damage in the, in the, in the immediate period as especially U.S. imperialism was supported by the rest of the West uh, and their allies in the region, Saudi Arabia and Israel, basically have, have done uh, over the years. Now, if we want to start with the... If we're going to get to Syria now... Uh, <laughs> yeah, one second... So, Syria, I mean, in Syria, obviously, there is a, it's not a straightforward situation because Syria did not start, the movement in Syria and the process in Syria did not start as a counter-revolutionary Islamic fundamentalist movement. Um, Syria was, in fact, a part of the chain of revolutions of the Arab revolution. It was a part of the bigger whole of a movement of the Arab masses throughout the region um, against dictatorship, against unemployment, against social decay, against um, basically a, a life in you know a terrible, terrible living conditions, which existed have, have, has existed in, in the Middle East for uh, for decades. Effectively, it was a revolt against capitalism. But the problem was that the, the movement, and we don't have time to go into Egypt and all these movements, but essentially the movements in those countries throughout the Arab world and the Middle East, did not realize what its fundamental problem was. It came out, you know, uh, wanting democracy, wanting social justice, and so on. But it didn't realize that all of these things were tied with capital, with Egyptian capitalism, with Tunisian capitalism. And they thought that they could just come to the squares, remove one dictator, and that's it. Then we can solve all our problems. Um, but obviously that's not, that's not what happened. They, they didn't take power over the, you know, over the main levers of power in society. They didn't take control over the state. They didn't take control over the economy. And basically those two key elements remained in the hands of the previous ruling class. And therefore you had a whole period of wave after wave of movements overthrowing one head of state after another. Extremely strong movements showing the enormous capacity of the working class, but also showing its uh, limitations when it does not have a revolutionary leadership and a program. That after several years of, of struggle, it began to ebb. And it, and it was in Syria, which was the weakest link of the Arab Revolution, you can say, that you saw the most extreme effects, and also in Libya, you can say, the most extreme effect of this, uh, uh, of this ebbing of the revolution, of the weaknesses of the revolution. Because, you see... Egypt had been a capitalist country for many years. Most of, many of the reforms that Nasser introduced had been reversed already. Unemployment, uh, social decay, all these things were very rife. And, and the state did not have a solid base to stand on. It didn't have, even the, you know, a few years before the revolution, there was a strike of tax collectors. That's the foundation of the state. Uh, in Egypt especially, because the state is like, six million men strong, it's almost like a welfare state. It just hires people without them doing jobs just to keep a, a portion of support. But that had already dwindled because of the crisis of capitalism and, and these things. But in Syria, that's what the situation was different because in Syria, in the 60s and 70s, you had through a series of coups, revolutionary coups in effect, you can say, 
you had a situation where capitalism was abolished, and you had the um, uh, uh, the rise of a society and a state basically based on a model of Soviet Russia. So a complete totalitarian dictatorship, but with a planned economy, which meant that they could develop Syria from being um, a country very much like Syria now, or even worse, very extremely backward, you know, basically just a desert, very little industry, no capitalism really, no capitalist development, just peasants and, and desert. Uh, they developed that to be a, a very advanced society uh, relative to the rest of this, uh, the area. Almost no unemployment, free education, free healthcare. One of the most, I think probably the most modern society in the Middle East, or one of them at least, very modern society, very high level of culture. And that was achieved over a few decades because of the planned economy that they had. Obviously, that was being reversed. Uh, they were beginning to privatize and they were you know, talking about the Chinese path and all these things. Uh, so unemployment was beginning to creep in. But at the same time, it, it hadn't yet settled and it hadn't touched... The, ca- the crisis of capitalism hadn't yet touched the main base of, of society and especially the working class looking everywhere around it in, in, in the Middle East, felt secure, felt stable, and they had a stable life. And they did, in fact, relative to everyone else. Um, now, this doesn't mean that they couldn't have been a revolution, but this means that the revolution would have to have had a stronger and a more far-sighted leadership. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> so, when, so, therefore, when the revolution came, out, came about, it was more as an impact of the Egyptian uh, and the Tunisian revolution than coming you know, from within Syrian society itself. Had it been left to itself, maybe it would have come a bit further down the road. And in fact, the, the movement started in areas which had been hit mostly by capitalism, especially in the East, because of the privatization of irrigation channels. There was a massive drought. Peasants, one million peasants had been uh, moved, you know, internally displaced. And they've been coming into these towns, especially in south, in the south, in the town, town of Dara, Dara, they say, <laughs> um, which is uh, which is where where a lot of them were huddled up, extremely poor, extremely angry at the whole situation, uh, and that's where the revolution caught on amongst these peasant layers, essentially, and amongst uh, the youth, a, a big part of the youth who wanted democracy. And they thought, well, we're just going to do like like they do in Egypt. We're just going to go to the squares and call it. Monday of rage or something like that and then we're going to overthrow Assad but obviously that didn't happen um, because the Assad regime had a base of support and for a lot of working class and urban uh, Syrians democracy in itself although they agreed with it and they weren't necessarily supporters of Assad but it wasn't a, enough to pull them out on the streets because they said well you want democracy what kind of democracy is it like, like Turkey was the best example of democracy they could imagine. And that wasn't really a, a stable country at all, if, if, if you think about it. Iraq was the second example of, of democracy. So without a revolutionary socialist program of having a socialist democracy, with social demands to raise living standards and so on, this vague idea of just let's have democracy, that was not enough to mobilize the working classes. And therefore you didn't have, in fact, you didn't have I had never heard of a single workers' strike during the, the, the Syrian revolution. And that was the main difference. If you see in Tunisia, Ben Ali fell after the, a three day, uh, the last three days of development of a, of a general strike. Mubarak fell again when the Egyptian workers started striking, and especially in the Suez Canal, which is a key uh, trade point <clears throat> globally. But in Syria, there was no workers' strikes. The working class did not come, I mean, more than individually, they didn't come as a class onto the scene. And therefore, the Assad regime, uh, the, the, the revolution met a, a uh, how do you say, a, a dead end. And although it had relatively healthy traditions, in fact, it was well, much better organized than in Egypt. They had neighborhood committees, you know, the activists, local activists from every, every neighborhood was organized. They had defense committees to defend the demonstrations and so on. It's very, very healthy in that sense, but they didn't have the program to appeal to the, to the working classes to come in. Um, and, and, uh, and in fact, the more democratic they became, the more they, they, you know, they set up this Syrian National Council, uh, which was basically you know, ex, ex-Assad officers and 
people from his uh, from from the the ruling class, and expats, you know, being supported by the West and so on. The more this direction towards being, you know, going under the influence of Western imperialism happened, the more, in fact, the revolution became isolated. And the key turning point, I think, came when in Libya, a foreign intervention helped the overthrow of of the um, Gaddafi regime, that a lot of Syrian revolutionaries thought, okay, well, we're just going to, let us call for, uh, you know, military intervention. And then that will solve everything and Assad will fall. And then we can, you know, we can expel maybe even the imperialists afterwards. You know, let's deal with that later on. But this fact that they started calling for a, for a military intervention completely isolated the revolution from, from a huge layer of the population who could see what, what military revolution meant, intervention meant in, in Iraq and other places. And that basically sealed the deal for the revolution. At the same time, Assad was pushing the revolution towards a more armed struggle uh, 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 character. And um, <clears throat> and the revolution basically bit, bit on this. And they started realizing that you know, demonstrations in and, in and off themselves wasn't enough. They had to go out. They thought, well, and they didn't have a, the idea of developing a more radical program. They developed uh, toward an, uh, a revolutionary war, basically, a civil war. And the problem is, if you, in a revolutionary war, I mean, you can have a revolutionary war, but if you don't have a program, that revolution is going to be extremely weak because in a revolution, the state will always be the strongest, uh, stronger than the revolution. The state has a clear chain of command, it has exercises, it has people who have been educated and been studying war, well-organized, well-equipped, uh, you know, they have tanks and these kind of... What a revolution can only have light handguns, maybe capture a tank here and there. They can't have the same advanced technology and organization as a, as a standing army can have. So this meant that the revolution, because it went towards a civil war, it also had to make up for its own weaknesses. I, it needed money, it needed arms, it needed all these things that the state had. And this... You know, open the floodgates really for Western imperialism, uh, supported by the Allies in the Gulf states, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and Jordan, to come in and funnel billions and billions and billions of dollars into this uh, revolutionary movement. Um, <clears throat> um, and basically, for two reasons: on the one hand, they wanted to hijack it; they wanted to cut across the Arab Revolution. And to make it an example of it, and I guess this is a, you know, what we have now is a very good example that they want to show that revolution is not really a good thing. Uh, and secondly, they wanted to overthrow Assad, which was their, their foe, their, their enemy in different ways, especially because of his alliance with, with Iran. Um, <clears throat> yes. Now, they thought, again, they thought this was going to be, um, and I was, I was sorry, in this intervention, obviously, most of the money went into the most counter-revolutionary and most reliable elements from the point of view of especially Saudi and Qatari and Turkish imperialism, which were Islamist forces. Now, they thought this was going to be a quick thing. A few months, I think they said six months, that's it. We're going to overthrow Assad uh, at most, and then we can, we can clean you know, the area and, and you know, change the situation. Um, but, but, but the problem was that because of this intervention, again, Assad became stronger. And in fact... I think a, a big part of the revolution uh, went back either to passive, you know, not supporting any side, or even to support uh, the Assad regime because they said, well, you know, having to choose between the Assad dictatorship and these animals, basically, uh, the choice is quite clear for a lot of people. Uh, so politically, the U.S. and the foreign intervention and the Islamization of the movement strengthened Assad. And in fact, he helped it. He released thousands of Islamist, Islamist prisoners uh, from his prisons in order to, to help this process of cutting through the revolutionary movement. In fact, Assad and everyone else, you know, all of the powers in the region united to crush the revolution in that sense, and then, and then to get on with business, their own business of settling who controls Syria, basically. Uh, but from then on, <clears throat> the, the Syrian revolution was essentially hijacked and became uh, a proxy war, a regional uh, imperialist and an international imperialist proxy war between the biggest powers of the region and internationally. Uh, 
uh, and became a completely reactionary thing that we can't trust. And I think this also shows what a, a mistake in a revolution can, can mean. If, if you do not have a correct program and a correct leadership, it's not just, okay, we're just going to go back to how things were. No, I mean, the, the, the revolution in and of itself opens the way for a counter-revolution. They follow each other. And if, one, if, if the revolution is not strong enough to take power, one way or another, the counter-revolution will uh, prevail and, and, the, and the results can be disastrous. Now, <clears throat> the stalemate in Syria also meant uh, that you had the radicalization of the movement. In fact, all the moderate Islamist forces, of course, none of them were really moderate, but uh, the most uh, dependable ones, the most established ones, like the Muslim Brotherhood, they were quickly pushed to a side and you had the radicalization of the movement towards uh, things like, the, that, like uh, ISIS. And... Um, Yes, and that obviously made things a bit different for uh, for the U.S. especially because now this short pro short term project had become a major liability, threatening to destabilize the whole region, which it ha which it is, but even more. And they needed to change course. Now, doing that basically changed the whole, brought up a, an enormous or. I mean, it revealed an enormous crisis of U.S. imperialism. If you remember, in 2013, right before the uh, rise of uh, ISIS, a few months before that, I think it was, or was it just a, a mix, mixing one? Oh, it was before that. Um, uh, you had, uh, uh, you know, the, the red, red, uh, red lines of the Obama administration had been crossed. He had proof, he says, allegedly, that Assad has been using um, sarin gas and other chemical weapons. And he was preparing for, to invade, basically, or to go, to go to war against Syria. But the problem was that politically, they couldn't get this through because of the costs of the Iraq and Af Afghanistan wars, the economic costs, but also the social costs. Uh, and added to that, the deep uh, crisis of U.S. capitalism the economic crisis of U.S. capitalism, which had, um, uh, which had again destabilized the whole situation, it meant that uh, they couldn't get the vote through. Basically, a big part of the ruling classes in the West did not believe, uh, well, well, thought that if they if they went to war in Syria, it will it would be a, a source of extreme instability economically and socially within uh, w within Europe and within the U.S. I mean. The Iraq War, at its height, I think it pulled, poured, took out 10 million people into the streets of the U.S., and that was way before the economic crisis. And at this, t at this stage, after, after this, I mean, I think if they had attacked Syria, they would have seen something much, much worse. And not to speak about the economic crisis, which is, you know, the, the, the U.S. Um, state owes, I think, 18 or $20 trillion dollars. Can, you know, it can another war of that scale of, ha of adding a couple of trillion dollars is completely impossible from from that point of view. So that meant that the U.S. was incapable politically, economically, even militarily, because of the low morale of the army and so on, to intervene independently in you know directly into the Syrian civil war, which meant that it had to lean on other forces. It had to lean on other people who had boots on the ground, basically. And who had boots on the ground? Assad had boots on the ground. The Iranians and their proxy Shiite militias had uh, boots on the ground. And well, later on, you had the development of the Kurdish areas as well. And besides them, no one, no dependable force had any boots on the ground. Oh, they were the Kurds in, in northern Iraq as well. But this meant that, Iraq, that the U.S. had no... Um, uh, no option but to lean on, on Iran and Iranian uh, uh, proxies, basically. Um, but this, in turn, uh, uh, alienated their own allies, especially Turkey, but especially um, Saudi Arabia, which sees Iran as an existential threat. Saudi Arabia is a, is a country in an extreme crisis, although it has tons of money. Uh, the, the state you know, rests on nothing. You know, it doesn't have any ideological reason for existing. Its, it's people are not really uh, loyal to it. Half of them are extreme jihadis who want a caliphate. Uh, some of them are Shias who hate this system. Some of them are young, um, you know, liberals who want 
um, who want a, a more democratic society. And then there are like tribal elements who just want their own peace. But now with the economic crisis and the fall in the oil prices, you know, they're, they're not getting their uh, share of the pie, uh, as you say. So therefore you have a, a, a society in a complete crisis and it sees Iran, its neighbor, as a major threat. So the U.S., uh, so and they they went to war in Syria in order to shore up for the rise of Iran. So the U.S. suddenly changing tunes and in Iraq especially and and in Syria, de facto leaning on uh, uh, Iranian allies and Iranian troops was a major blow to the Saudi uh, uh, to the to the Saudi regime, and it meant and it caused a, a, a huge crisis within uh, within that alliance between the U.S. and and, and Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, then further on, uh, the U.S. Are, well, you know, in Syria at least we can't really. They didn't lean on Assad, but they kind of left the Assad areas alone. But then they tried to lean on the Kurds instead, in order not to, in, you know, disrupt the relationship with the Saudis. But what happened was that they they ended up disrupting the uh, the, the relationship with Erdogan, their other ally, which for him. The, 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 the Kurdish struggle is an exist the Kurdish problem is an existential problem. Um, the, you see, um, Erdogan for many years was riding on a uh, how to say high of economic um, an economic boom, but at a certain stage when the boom in 2009 I think it started uh, uh, receding and the economy started going down, you had the beginning of increased instability, increased class struggle. And the whole focal point of that class struggle became the Kurdish movement because all the Turkish leftist organizations had completely collapsed and completely capitulated. And the only clean hands which remained were, was a, a party called the HDP, which is a Kurdish-based party, but although it's all Turkish, it's, it's, it's a left-leaning uh, organization, and which had, had, which had received enormous authority because of the, the conduct of the Kurds inside Syria. Because it, in Syria, everyone from Turkey could see that the Kurds are fighting ISIS, the best people fighting ISIS, in fact, and their own government is supporting ISIS and is supporting all these other jihadi people who uh, a lot of Turkish people being very secular uh, hate. So therefore, this HCP became a, a major political stumbling block for Erdogan. And uh, he embarked on a civil war against the Kurds, basically. And he radicalized that movement even further to the point that today the, it, you know, the, 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 the Kurdish problem, i.e. The, the question of the southeastern areas of Turkey, which are mainly populated by Kurds, have become an existential threat. In fact, the fact that there is a small statelet called Rojava in Syria means that it's an example to follow for, for other Kurds inside uh, Turkey, and this could lead to the breakup of Turkey in the future. So the fact that the U.S. suddenly started leaning on these people, who Erdogan sees as an existential threat, uh, obviously disrupted again the whole uh, relationship between, um, b between these allies, and Turkey is a very, very important ally, ally uh, uh, of, of the U.S., especially because it's a NATO country, and it shores up Russia in the you know, southwestern border, borders of Russia is, 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 is extremely valuable. The U.S. has nuclear bombs in, uh, in, in Turkey. They have several bases and, and so on. <clears throat> so the, this situation inside Syria basically brought to the fore the crisis of U.S. Uh, imperialism and U.S. capitalism, in effect, and, and, exposed, uh, and exposed the situation. And in this vacuum... The, the, the fact that the U.S. was incapable of, of acting, of intervening, uh, created a vacuum into which, first of all, Iran stepped, basically taking over huge areas or dominating huge areas of Iraq and now uh, Syria. And also then Russia saw its, uh, its, uh, a, a chance to step in, especially because it felt threatened by the U.S. and other places, and it already had a base in Syria. It already had relationship with the Syrian army and so on. Uh, and Russia stepped in um, last year, and that completely changed the whole situation. Basically, the intervention of Russia meant, uh, uh, and the year following that, meant that the U.S. could no longer dream about overthrowing Assad uh, 
uh, or even carving up Syria, basically. Uh, and, uh, and, and yeah, they couldn't do anything about it. They couldn't attack the Russians. They couldn't attack uh, the, the, the Assad regime anymore. And so all this thing they talk about now with a no-fly zone and we have to this completely utopian thing because it would require a massive land invasion of, of huge parts of Syria, which is something, you know, the U.S. couldn't even muster a war against Syria or couldn't even win o over in Iraq or in Afghanistan. Of course, they cannot win against Russia, Iran, and Syria uh, uh, put together. So that completely changed the situation. Now, the Russians from the beginning, I'm summing up now, and it's been, it's been a bit long, but the Russians from the beginning, you know, Putin is a cynical person. He's not a, a humanitarian by any account. They wanted a deal. They wanted to say, look, we're allowing the Americans a way to go out of this with dignity, basically, without costing too much from you, of you. Let's make a deal together. Let's, you know, divide up Syria in between us, and then in other places in the world, we can, you know, we will be seen, will be seen as a world power, basically. But the Americans refused this, and, and the Russians, in spite of the Iranians and Assad being against this from the beginning, several times, three times, the Russians offered the U.S. ceasefires and some, some kind of a deal um, to do this. And the latest ceasefire, a month and a half ago, was, was sabotaged by the Americans themselves, in fact, probably it was sabotaged by the Pentagon, who, who you know, the State Department, like John Kerry wanted to make a deal, but the Pentagon refused because they, they cannot be seen as, as working with Russia. Their whole mindset is being against Russia. Um, and they disrupted it. And that's what, what led to Aleppo, to the fall of Aleppo, which was basically the Russians, uh, the Iranians, and the uh, Assad regime showing everyone that America is, uh, that the U.S. imperialism is um, impotent to do anything. I mean, they were only down the road, like literally there's a road going out of Aleppo and down that road, the Americans are stationed. Uh, they have special forces, they have an air force there, they have a base nearby, but they couldn't do anything and it exposed them completely. Um, and also, I would say it sealed the deal for the Assad regime. I mean, the Assad regime can no longer fall. The four major towns of Syria are under his control. The rebellion, the, the rebels or the Islamists or all these groups, whatever you want to call them, they're completely demoralized. One town after another, they're reconciling. Some of them are, are moving away. And the rest are being huddled up in this Idlib area, which is a, uh, which is a very rural area with no real importance for anyone. And... Um, <clears throat> And also, afterwards, they, I mean, they will lose a lot of support because the people who've been pouring billions of dollars into them also have no purpose anymore for them because they can't really think of going back and retake Aleppo or any other major town. Um, U.S. imperialism has been completely uh, humiliated. They try to intervene. They try to break up Syria and overthrow uh, uh, its, uh, its uh, president and its, its regime. But, it, but they failed to do that. And that's a, and that's a very big uh, humiliation. I, think, I don't think it's anything like this has happened for many, many years, for decades, probably. And, and at least not openly like in a warlike situation. They have botched up coup attempts and this kind of a thing. But this is a, a major blow to US imperialism. More importantly, probably in relative terms, Saudi imperialism has received a, a massive blow. Their, all their groups have been completely crushed. And uh, Russia, Russia has made a deal with Turkey, which means that Turks are pulling out their troops. And probably now what's going to happen is that the jihadi groups, which is basically Saudi and CIA-supported groups, uh, they've been uh, so, uh, how do I say, separated from the Turkish-supported groups, and they're going to be crushed. So Saudi Arabia is going to see this prestige project of theirs completely unravel. And this will add to the internal crisis. Already now inside Saudi Arabia, there's a huge discontent with the Yemen war, which is costing billions and billions of dollars. And at the same time, they're imposing austerity for the first time in, in Saudi history. And the Syrian civil war will add to that, to the demoralization of internally within the regime, the infighting, all of these things. And inside, in Mosul as well, in Iraq, you see that the Saudis are no longer, I mean, they're not even seen as an important uh, force anymore. 
Although this doesn't mean they're not going to intervene anymore, do things which are really crazy. But it sh it's, it's going to be a huge blow. And, a, and, a, and one of these blows, uh, a blow like this could lead uh, at a certain stage to the unraveling of Saudi Arabia in itself. You know, a, a civil war, basically. Uh, revolutionary movements and counter-revolutionary movements coming out of out of that itself, and this is a this is a this is one of those the type of blows which could lead to something like that. Um, for Turkey, I think in in the relationship with Turkey and Russia, you see the the real essence of Russian imperialism coming out because Turkey was also crushed. Turkey was unable to do anything, but the Russians made an extra effort to pull Turkey back in and they even gave them a plot of land like a little enclave in uh, northern Syria uh, where they can have all their, their jihadis and semi-jihadi people and, all, and, uh, and put all the refugees and so on and give them a major influence over what's going to happen now inside Syria although they didn't have to do that but from a Russian point of view there's two elements first of all they want to disrupt NATO they want to show the Americans that they can they, you know, they have half, the Turks have half the foot in each camp, or one foot in each camp. Uh, and also, they want someone to balance against Iran and Assad, who want to take, you know, who, who are more inclined to taking over and crushing the Islamist forces and crushing all other forces, whereas the Russians would rather like to have like a frozen conflict, a conflict in which all the powers of the region have, have a stake they have a tiny plot of land, tiny warlords here and there controlling this. And then the Russians will be the weight, you know, they can just shift from one side to another, play them out against each other. And especially Iran and Turkey, who are now coming out of this as the two major powers of the Middle East, the two great powers probably in the future they will be of the whole Middle East. And for, for the Russians, they don't want any of them to be, uh, to be too strong because the Russians are in fact, I mean, they don't have the same interests. In fact, they compete against both of them in Central Asia, they compete against the Turks in, in Eastern Europe, uh, you know, the, the Turkish imperialism has very far-reaching um, ambitions. And so this, is, this shows the real essence of, of Russian imperialism, that although they could have, in fact, destroyed the Islamists and all these, you know, all these gangs and reactionary forces, they didn't. Uh, and, and instead they, they kept them uh, half alive. Now, just to sum up, this is, I think, what, what the Syrian civil war and revolution really shows is uh, it reveals the, t the period that we've come in, and it reveals the crisis of capitalism. You know, we, we talk about ca capitalist economy being an anarchic economy because everyone is just, uh, you know, everyone competes against each other because as there is private ownership of the means of production, people compete with each other, and therefore they can't plan the system. But I think imperialist, imperialism and imperialist wars and the foreign policy is similar, because all of them, just like all capitalists in the world, they want peace and stability, all of them, but they just want it but on their own terms, and they all have an existential relation to this thing. For Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia you see clearly how this can destabilize the whole thing, and if they hadn't intervened, in fact, the rise of Iran, uh, uh, the rise of, of the Iranian power in the region would have become a threat to them sooner rather than, rather than later. So they had to do it. For uh, Erdogan now, I mean, he, he has to stop uh, the Kurdish movement somehow. I don't think he will succeed. Well, we have to see. He has to stop it. And if he didn't intervene, and if he doesn't intervene now, uh, he can't pull out anymore, basically. For the Americans, once they were in there, they couldn't pull out because the humiliation, which is what we're going to see in the next period, is that because of the humiliation of the U.S. imperialism, we're going to see more instability. Smaller powers, both allies of the U.S. and enemies of the U.S., are going to, are going to maneuver more. You're going to see uh, China, you know, countries like China pushing the U.S. even more. Now we see with the Philippines, um, things going on, you know, China, China and Philippines getting closer to each other. But we're going to see more examples of that. India is going to push them more. Japan is going to push them uh, more, more probably. The Europeans, in Europe, there's, you know, the Americans always want Europe to put pressure on Russia, but the Europeans never really want to because they, they want trade with Russia. But that disagreement is going to increase, and the fault lines we see in between, um, <coughs> in between the, 
the the great the powers of the world is going to be become clearer. Whereas after World War Two, you had a system which was completely dominated by the by U.S. imperialism, uh, an army and an economy which was beyond anything else. They they had the fifty percent of world GDP was being produced in the U.S. But that's over now. Today is the figure is about twenty two or twenty three percent, and it's declining. Whereas countries like China are relative, rising rel- relatively, U.S. the U.S. Army is in a, is in a, in a crisis in effect in many ways. Although it's still like, enormously powerful, but it, it's not you, the U.S. imperialism is not powerful enough to overman any obstacle anymore, and that's been exposed uh, in, in in Syria. And that's going to lead to more instability, more frictions within the powers. But just like we're going to see more wars and more friction in foreign policy, the same crisis will also lead to more revolutionary uh, uh, trends and revolutionary developments. In the Middle East, I would say nothing is really solved. Because uh, if you look at Egypt, I mean, the three main countries in the Middle East, Egypt, Iran, and Turkey. In Egypt, Egypt is going through the worst crisis of its history today. In every term, in every in every possible way, it's an extreme, extremely deep crisis, and at some point, the revolutionary movement will be pushed back onto the agenda. It's not it's not going to be a choice, but it's going to be a push because people are literally going hungry. Not just working class people and poor, but even the middle classes are losing everything because of extreme inflation and and uh, an economic crisis in Turkey. Uh, the Erdogan regime has, has leaned on economic uh, growth for the past 15 years. But that's finished. And in fact, the Turkish economy has been declining very rapidly just over the past two months. Um, and that's going to take away the support that Erdogan had from a huge layer of the Turkish working class. And on top of that, the working class has increased, I think, by twofold. It's doubled over the past 20, 20 years in, in, in Turkey. Turkey has got a huge working class now. And a lot of them are going to be, you know, people who support Erdogan because he took them out of the village and gave them, you know, the modern lives that they have now. But once the crisis hit, the 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 um, contradictions of their interests are going to become clearer, and class struggle is going to be on the agenda again, uh, and, and, and so on. And also in Iran, I would say that uh, well, we are going to have to see what the situation is. But the Iranian cri- uh, regime is constantly stumbling from one crisis to another. It's, it's like every day you look at the media, there's like a new scandal. Like insane scandals. You would never think of how, how these things are going on. And it's, and it's become a daily day, day thing. Iranians are almost numb to extreme scandals, extreme corruption scandals, sexual scandals, economic scandals, all kinds of you know, I- 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 scandals. People are fed up. People just don't have... Uh, you know, in fact... At the, in the parliamentary elections last year, uh, there was not a single religious slogan, which is incredible. And it shows the pressure we're building up from beneath. The people have had enough of it. Even the most extreme uh, people and, and parties and so on did not put forward a purely religious agenda, which is normally what, you know, in the beginning, early days of the revolution, when the regime had a base, that was what it was based on. Um, and... Um, and th- there are signs that people have just had enough, and how and when it's going to reflect itself and, and express itself, we don't know. But once things develop in a country like Iran with very, very deep revolutionary traditions, it might come from something completely insignificant, but because of the logic of the system itself, it will, uh, it, it, it will change the whole situation and, and, it, and it will revive many of the old traditions. And that's where the savior of Syria <laughs> lies. That's, where, that's how you can, you know, that's when the situation in Syria will change. Based on revolutionary developments in, in, in other countries, not only in the Middle East, by the way, throughout the world, uh, which, is, which is seeing this, the effects of the same crisis, uh, although you know, you know, maybe at a slight of different pace and, and pressure, but leading towards the same um, conclusions. Thanks.